Hello POBC and our online community. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday for our online service. Look, while you're watching, we want you to be as interactive as possible. Please comment, amen, give us a thumbs up, and also share this live webcast with your friends and family. Look, during this time, it is still important for us to invest into the kingdom of God. So if you would like to give, we've made it very easy for you. Please visit pobc.cc forward slash give. Also, if you want to, you can also text to give by texting any dollar amount to 84321. You can also mail your offering in to our church as well. But just a quick reminder, our physical campus will be closed until further notice. But the good news is our online campus is still open for you. We are committed to staying connected together through the internet through this process. If you would like to stay up to date, please visit pobc.cc forward slash COVID-19. Look, again, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday service, and we look forward to seeing what God is going to do through this season that we're in. God bless you, and let's have a great Sunday.
to everybody joining us at home, wherever you're watching it, if it's on your phone, on a computer, on a TV, however you're joining us, we're very glad that you're being a part of our online service. Thank you so much for being a part and for worshiping with us. And as we go through this, however long this last week in, week out, we really want to encourage people, if you're at home, treat it as much like church as you can. Raise your hands. Sing along with this group. I, you can feel the presence of God in this place, and I don't believe that's going to be lost in the people that are at home right now. I think that's going to translate really well, actually. And I believe that we're going to have revival in the midst of all this. This is not going to be a dead season that we're just trying to get through. God is going to use this to reveal something incredible in His Spirit. I have that, that expectation in my heart 100%, and I'm excited about these next few weeks. I'm also excited to get back into church service with everybody, but uh, for right now... Let's use this and let's let God be, be seen and glorified through all of this. When I was young, probably seven, eight years old, for the first time, my dad showed me a card trick. And I can't perform the card trick for you because my dad never told me how to perform the card trick. He just told me that it was magic. And he would take out these cards. I remember how he would do it. He would take out these cards. I'd, he'd make me pick one and then he'd shuffle the deck and... Then he'd lay out a stack of cards and fan them out. And then he'd lay out another stack and fan them out, lay another stack out and fan them out. And I know that the trick probably had to be simple, but I couldn't figure it out. And I remember vividly when I was, <laughs> I was in my bed with the covers pulled up and my eyes would just be wide open, trying to go to sleep. Like, I have no idea how he did that. I don't know how he did it. And he just laughed about it every single time. He never would tell me. And if I asked him today, I'm 36 now, he probably still wouldn't tell me today. I have no doubt in my mind. He probably wants to keep that secret as long as possible. I could probably look it up on YouTube, but I'm not going to do that. But I, I guess I probably like magic tricks. Probably. I'm not going to perform any. But I probably like them. And I say probably because it drives me crazy not knowing how people do this stuff. I have no idea how. I remember there was one time they displayed, there was a, I went to a friend's house and he told me they're going to reveal all these magic tricks, how they really do them. And so I watched, I watched this, this program where they started revealing stuff like how do they saw the woman in half and then separate those two things. And I remember watching it. And it was so simple whenever you see it played out. But I kind of preferred it before I knew. And so you start to realize why this illusion kind of has to stay the way that it is. But in, in the Word of God, there's a few stories that you could probably say that there's some element of magic that took place within it. I'm not talking about the miracles of Jesus. I'm not talking about all that because that's, that's the miracles of God. That's completely different. That's totally different. But there's a few things that you can read in the Word of God, especially the Old Testament. You can say, well, there's some kind of something going on spiritually. I don't know what it was exactly. It would be a good magic trick if I could get these things back in the box that came out of. But there's a few of them, and there's one in particular that kind of caused me problems. I've thought about it actually many times, and I've, I've read about it many times, because I tried to figure out how, if the Bible's phrasing it this way, then does it seem to indicate that there's a real life, actual, some sort of magic or sorcery going on? And I'm going to draw from that story in a moment. It's in 1 Samuel 28 that the story kind of picks up. And you, you read 1 Samuel, and you read about the life of Saul, and Saul's kind of a frustrating figure because Saul should have been so much more. But for some reason, he just had these issues. He had these problems, these things that just kind of kept him from being who he was supposed to be. Because God chose him, but then God also regretted later choosing him. In 1 Samuel 28, the Philistine armies were gathered for war against Israel. And King Saul was afraid when he looked out and he saw the armies of the Philistines. And he knew that his men couldn't stand against him. He knew that this was going to be a problem. And he also knew that God had removed his power from him because of his disobedience. So he's panicking in that moment. And he was afraid. And so he had already kind of cast out all the mediums and all the spiritists and the people that we might regard as witches. He had cast them out from the kingdom. He drove them all out. But when he came to this moment, Samuel, the prophet of God, had died. God's spirit had been removed from Saul. God's anointing had been removed from him so he needed counsel he needed somebody to give him assurance some kind of knowledge anything that he could get he wanted in that moment so he had his servants find a medium or somebody that we would call a witch she's referred to as the witch of Endor she was exiled with the Ewoks 
and indoor. I'm pretty sure that's doctrine. Don't sit at me, Tyler. You can. S- but he put on a disguise and he made his way to this witch. And he, that was a dumb thing to say. I'm sorry. Don't edit that out. Just leave it on the webcast. But <laughs> he put on this disguise and he made his way to the witch. And then he walks in the house. She doesn't know who he is. They snuck out of the camp. He just had a few servants with him. And in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 11, it says, Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? Because he, he wanted her to bring up a spirit. She knew this. Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. I don't know why all of a sudden she knows that it's him then. But, and the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Saul, or Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, and this is what bothers me. This is what kind of has messed with me over the years about this verse. The Bible doesn't say that it seemed to be Saul, that it was an apparition, that it was a spirit pretending to be Saul. It says, now Samuel said to Saul. It was Samuel in his spirit communicating. It wasn't somebody pretending to be Samuel. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed for the Philistines make war against me. And God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, so why do you ask me, seeing that the Lord has departed from you, has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand. And given it to your neighbor, David. Samuel ended this moment by saying, Tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. And that is as as ominous of a statement as I've ever heard in the word of God. And the Lord will deliver Israel to the Philistines. In the battle that was to come, Saul was hit by an archer. And in his state, he realized, I'm not going to be able to defend myself anymore. And we're losing this battle. And so he asked his armor bearer, would you please kill me on the spot? Kill me right now. And he wouldn't do it. He was afraid. And so Saul fell upon his own sword and died there that day along with his three sons, his armor bearer, and all of his men. And so the reason I'm bringing this story up is because for a separate project, I've been looking at the lives and the comparisons between Saul and between David. And there's something about their story that I I can't quite let go of because when you compare their lives on the surface, there's some elements of it that don't really seem fair. Because if you... you, (laughs) Look at Saul, and it seems, I'm not saying it was absolutely the case, but it seems that his greatest sin was not waiting on Samuel when he was late for a sacrifice and not killing all the Amalekites. When you compare it to David's greatest sin, which was killing his faithful friend and stealing his wife, it doesn't seem like everything adds up in the story on the surface. It seems like one of them got treated a little bit differently in the story, but again, that was just the surface. It seems like we demonize Saul and we deify David. But it's not that simple. For time's sake, I'm not going to go over it. But if you want to go over the details, a lot of you, if you're quarantined away from work, or if you're working from home, maybe you have a little bit more time, read through 1 Samuel and, and read about the life and the rule of, of King Saul because there's some details that you may have skipped over. Look at this story and look at what he did and see where the problem started. But God had pointed Saul out to Samuel from the beginning. Whenever the people demanded a king, God, this was not God's plan for them. They demanded a king, and he said to Samuel, prophesy to them, tell them what a king is going to do to you. He told them, and they said, no, we still want a king to judge us. We still need a king like the rest of the world around us. We want a king. So God found this man named Saul. He was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. He was apparently pleasing to look at. This was a man that everybody looked at and admired. He said, this is going to be the first king of my kingdom, Israel. But when it came time to publicly appoint him, he was nowhere to be found. Samuel gets up in front of the crowd and everybody's looking for him. God told him he's he's hidden among the stuff. The King James Version says the stuff. Some other translations say the baggage. And if if you want to sneak a preach there, you could do so with that word. But he was basically in the tool shed. He was hiding behind the lawnmower trying to avoid everybody. Because he didn't want to be ordained king of Israel. Didn't feel up to the challenge. He was absolutely cowering in fear. And I want you to remember that for a moment. Cowering in fear. In the early days of his kingdom after he had ascended to the throne. In 1 Samuel 13. Saul was told to wait on Samuel. 
before you proceed into battle. Wait on Samuel to make a sacrifice before entering into that war. And he waited for seven days and Samuel still had not appeared. And so Saul gets a little impatient. He decides, you know what? I think it's fine. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make this sacrifice. But he stepped outside of the will of God. That simple act of di disobedience had severe repercussions for King Saul. He just rushes in and sacrifices. And at the very moment he's wrapping up the sacrifice, that's when Samuel shows up, which is comedically perfect timing. But he shows up and he's like, what are you doing? You, you knew that you were supposed to wait on me. What are you doing right now? And he confesses to him. He said, look, I've, I've waited on you. It's been seven days. I didn't know if you were coming. And I'm looking. And we think that they're going to attack at any moment. We're hiding away right now. We're just trying to hide and just bite our time. But we're scared that we're going to get attacked. So I had to make this sacrifice because I wanted the blessing of God. But in doing so, he eliminated the blessing of God because his disobedience was the core of his issue in that day. And so that day Samuel told Saul, God has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the kingdom would be stripped from Saul that very day. Again, later in his rule in 1 Samuel 15, Saul again disobeys the word of God. He's told to utterly destroy Amalek. Don't leave any person, any animal, anything alive. Don't take anything for yourself. This is God's punishment upon the Amalekites. But Saul spared their king Agag. They didn't kill all the best livestock. They took that home with him. They took some of the best home with him. And in 1 Samuel 15 and 11, it says, God says, I greatly regret that I've set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. God had already removed the throne from King Saul, but this added disobedience caused such grieving in the heart of Samuel because he knew how far outside of God's will Saul had stepped. But I want you to look at those three scenarios with me. And if you're at home, I want you to participate a little bit. I'm going to look at the primary camera. If you're at home, participate when I say this. For Saul, his disobedience looked like fear. Everybody say fear. fear. As a young man appointed to be king, hiding from the will of God. It looked like impatience. Say impatience. As an inexperienced king waiting on Samuel who served as the voice of God. And it looked like control everybody say control as an established king who refused to wipe out all of Amalek as God had commanded so he could not trust God's word he could not trust God's timing and he could not trust God's provision he cast all of that aside but the common theme in all of that and it's the word that you heard it but you probably were listening to the word the timing and the provision the common theme in all of it was trust trust for Saul was a difference in every decision that he made in his life. It was the lack of trust. It's what caused him to cower, cower behind the stuff back at home. As God said, I want you to be my king. No, he was cowering in fear. It was a trust issue. And on the other side of the coin, you had David. Remember this. It was always for Saul, always a matter of trust. But on the other side, there's David. And we're not going to read all of David's story because if you wanted to go in depth, we... We could have like a whole series. This virus could last as long as it wanted. We could talk about David the whole time. We're not gonna. Psalm 26 through 7, it shows you David's perspective. And David's perspective was different. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 25 and 4, show me your ways, O God. Teach me your paths, lead me in your truth, and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Saul could not wait a little over seven, but David said, I'm going to wait on you as long as I have to. Psalm 31 and 13, for I hear the slander of many. Fear is on every side. Listen, this is our world right now. Fear is on every side. While they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take away my life. But as for me, as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant and save me for your mercy's sake. David trusted in what he couldn't see. David appealed to the mercies of God. He gave thanks and he asked for God's instruction. 
He reveled in the mysteries of God. The things that Saul could not see drove him insane. But David reveled in the mysteries of God. If you read through the Psalms, I know that David wasn't responsible for all of them. But you get the impression that when they speak about the mysteries of God, it causes a sense of awe and wonder. It's not a moment of fear. It's not a moment to cower behind this stuff. It's something to revel in because if you know God, if you know God, you can trust in him. To trust in God means that we accept that there's a part of his plan that we will never be privy to. There are parts of God's plan. If you read the New Testament and you start revealing the mysteries, there's a lot to be said in there. But there's part of God's plan that you will never know until you reach the other side. There's parts of God's plans. We will not have a clue until we reach the other side. But it's obvious that this is a time period right here today. The world that we're living in right now with this COVID-19 coronavirus mess going on all around us. This is a time period in which people need to commit to trusting God like David instead of dealing with that trust issue like Saul. When we talk about trust in God, all too often we kind of go towards the trials, the stuff that we can't explain, the stuff that causes the fear, the, the stuff that causes the issues that we're, tr we're trying to validate our trust in God and trying to make sense of why we should trust God in this moment, but it's not just about trusting God in the trials. We have to learn, if we're to trust God in the mysteries, we have to praise him for those mysteries, in all of his mysteries. How can we explain the blessings of God? How can we explain the good things that have happened to us? How can we explain his goodness? How can we do that? How can we glory in his greatness? It's not just to try to trust him in the dark times but to praise the mysteries of his goodness to us. Because truth be told, I have not earned one single good thing that has ever happened to me in my life. And you say, well, you know, if you work hard, yes, you're going to be re rewarded for hard work. But the great blessings in my life that can only come from God, I can't explain them. I'm not going into our own personal history, but people from our church know that our family's had our own share of trials. We've had our own share of moments where we try to have... So do the whole thing where you're trusting in God and learning to trust in God, sometimes struggling with trusting in God. Some trials have even been recent, but just about two days ago, I was holding our little child, and our little girl's two months old today, and I was holding her. And even her, she's dealing with a little upper respiratory infection right now, so we're praying for that. But I looked down at her, and in the midst of of everything that's going on in this world, I look down and, and I, I look and she smiles back and she's gotten very smiley the past few days and it's killing me because I'm all of a sudden a girl dad and I quite like it. But she smiles back at me and I, I started tearing up as I'm prone to do pretty much over anything. And I, I teared up and I just started saying, God, I, I don't know what I did to deserve this. And there's something about the beauty of the mysteries of God's blessings that are just as incredible. Is finding trust in God in the trials. There's something just as beautiful in it. Matthew 6 and 25 says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Is not life more than toilet paper that is suddenly not in stock at Target or anywhere? Verse 30, now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? See, my, my dad laid out the cards, usually did it on the carpet. I'd sit down on the floor and my dad would lay out the cards for me. And he'd do his little magic trick and I'd get frustrated and then I would hate all magic for the rest of my life. Just kidding, I still like it. But he'd start laying out those cards. And they say that you kind of tend to view God the same way that you view your earthly father. You kind of get the same impression of God. And some people, if, they, if they've had a rougher childhood and they didn't have the father that they wish they had, or sometimes even a father in the picture at all, they have to kind of reconcile their view of God to make sure that they don't correlate the two. But I, I get the picture of God, especially, especially with my father. And I feel like God sometimes just tossed stuff out that I can't explain. I, I, I didn't plan for it. 
I didn't exactly work for it in this particular way, but he just tossed his stuff out in my life. I said, look, you're going to be born into a family that loves you. And I'm like, that's my card. I'm taking that one. Like, that's fine. That's the eight of spades, I guess, a good family. I, I don't know if that, I wish it was an ace of spades. That would have worked great. But he starts dealing these cards in our life, and it's sometimes a lot to handle, you know, and those went out, and it's okay, that's, that's, that's your family, now you're going to have a good church, I'm like, I'm, I'm getting dealt some really good cards, God's going to save you from this, that's another great card, he's dealing something good, and he's like, okay, here's a time in your life, you're going to deal with a sickness that, the time will pass, but you're not, you're not going to get over it for a while, like, you know what, God, that's not my card, you can take that one back, you can just put that back, because then we start feeling like God's dealing out from the bottom of the deck. Like, God, I've got my eye on you right now. I've got my eye on you. I don't want that car, but he said, no. Sorry. That's part of it. And see, the, the mystery of this, we want to know why. We want to know why. But for some reason, we, we don't want to know why with all this other good stuff. We just, we accept that as, that, that must be God's will. That must be God's plan. This is the other one. God, don't trick us. Don't pull a trick on us that's going to make us hate all magic for, for now on. But a blessing comes in our life. You get a new job. I don't know why everything just turned out the way that it did, but I'm going to thank God for that. Here's the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm saving you. I'm thanking God for that. That's obviously God's will. But here's the season when I'm going to trust you. You're going to need to trust me because that same job that I bless you with now, that same job is in jeopardy. You say, God, I don't want that card. I don't want it. But see, God doesn't pick a card and say, is this your card? He doesn't do that. He just says, this is your card. And that's the end of the conversation. And then you have all the world absolutely losing their minds right now. And you have, everybody's dealt this card right now. It's this, <laughs> this whole coronavirus card. And then you have some people saying, that's not our card. That's, that's a government conspiracy. That's not our card. It is a, an exaggeration. That's not, no, the, the card's not quite what you said, God. This is actually catastrophic. Or everybody on the planet's going to die at this point. This is the apocalypse. And we're all trying to make sense of this mystery that's going on around us because we don't know how this is going to affect the church in our mind. But God's still up there just dealing every card. So our life, you know, we get this child. Like, Here's your child. There's a blessing. Here's coronavirus. Child's going to be inside with you a lot. Here's where you feel alone. Here's where you're worried about how you're going to pay the bills during this time. Here's where you're worried, how am I going to continue my kid's education? I don't even know how to do common core math. How am I going to do this at home? Here's the part where this one, I, that, that one's not going to work. I got it. Here we go. That almost felt like God's will. Here's the part where you definitely don't deserve it, but you're going to feel my arms wrap around you. And here's the part where the whole world is worried about what this means, but somehow the church of God heads into an unprecedented and unexpected revival in the midst of chaos. Because right now there are so many people and they're trying to deal with every card that they've been dealt at this point and say, God, I don't know what I can do with this. I don't know what I can do with it. This doesn't add up to, to anything that I can. What am I going to tell my family about this? But God just, ca just still cast it and said, hey, have you not read my word? Do you not, do you not know what I promise you? There's going to be this latter day revival. There's going to be something that comes across. And then finally, when everything is done, there's going to be one more card dealt. It's another ace. And the final card, if there's trust, if there's trust with all of this, then that final card is well done. Thou good and thou faithful servant. The difference between David and Saul was not even the severity of the sin because David did so many things that I can't, I can't explain where his head was. But then you read the Psalms. 
and you know where his heart was. The, re- the reason that David repented with absolute confidence and assurance and trust was because he had been through some things and he would wrote some songs by himself tending his father's sheep. And at some point, in isolation, just the voices of those animals, he developed a trust in God that lasted. And he has the distinction of being the only person that we know in the word of God. It's said to be a man after God's own heart. If you're at home, you might be sitting in a home that you don't know how you're going to pay for if this lasts for a few more weeks or months. If you're at home, you might be in a place that you bought with money from a job that you don't know is necessarily going to exist for much longer. I rebuke the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus Christ. I want us to do something. Trust is 100% about surrender. Surrendering our own thoughts, our own thoughts, our own process that goes to our mind that we say, this is how it all has to match up. This is how the sequence has to play out. Trust is surrender. So if you would at home, please, right now, if you're sitting on your couch with your family, everybody close your eyes. And I want us to raise our hands in the absolute sign, the universal sign of surrender and say, God, we are not afraid. We are not worried. We trust 100% in the precious word of God. We need to hold on to the promises that came in the light that will carry us through this, this temporary time of darkness. God, if there's fear in a home right now, I'm praying that you would le- unleash trust in that home. Loose it, Father, with people that are struggling with fear. There's no place for it. Not in your church, not in your people, not in the people of the name of Jesus Christ, not in our homes. God, trust. Build it in us all right now. And Father, what's being built in this moment is what's going to carry us into the unprecedented revival. I believe that it's already happening right now. There's somebody across the street. You're sitting in the home right now. There's a neighbor across the street that is going to reach out. And they're going to say, I've got worry in my life right now. How are y'all doing? And you're going to say, we trust in God. And they're going to want what we have. Jesus, we trust in you. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. It comes from the Father. And God, I can't explain the little bumps in the road. But God, I can't explain your blessings either. But we're sitting in a building right now that will once again be filled with people worshiping the name above every other name. But for right now, we have people all across the city, all across the state, people that are joining from around the world right now. I pray that the trust in God that you so desire would be unleashed all across this earth in the name of Jesus Christ. Our singers are going to sing once more. If you're in your home right now, I pray that you would tap into the Spirit and let the peace that passes all understanding be unleashed in our homes right now. Raise your hands, close your eyes, and begin to lift up your own voice and sing and pray to God right now, Father. You are in this. God, you are in this. We're not alone right now. You are in this, God.
Lord. 